Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar by the Institute of Product Leadership. The Institute of Product Leadership is a B-School dedicated to product leaders and innovators. We have four campuses located across the globe with over 1,600 delighted alumni from over 200 companies. The School of Data Science at the Institute of Product Leadership offers an MBA in Data Science and Business Analytics. This is a 24 month long intensive program that is intended for professionals with zero to seven years of work experience. The program is run in collaboration with the MIT University in Pune and will also be launching shortly in Bangalore. We also have a month long skill boot camps across a variety of areas. Some examples of the boot camps we have are data science for decision making, programming for data science, machine learning, advanced data modeling for decision making, big data engineering, and data visualization and consulting. Coming to the webinar for this evening, we are delighted to have with us Jay Vardhan Sambedu, who is our speaker for today. Jay is the head of Emerging Trends and Technologies at Society General. And the webinar theme for this evening is blockchain. A couple of minutes are not sufficient to speak about Jay, but I'm going to try my best anyway. Jay is a seasoned IT professional who is currently leading Emerging Trends and Technologies at Society General. In the past, um, while at Infosys, he has worked for several leading global financial institutions, such as Deutsche Bank, Royal Bank of Scotland, Citizens Bank, and the Union Bank of Switzerland. Jay is also the founding vice president of the India Blockchain Forum, which advises the government of Andhra Pradesh and the government of India and the government of India on various blockchain initiatives. Jay has recently addressed key stakeholders at the International Petroleum Week in London in 2017. He's also regularly seen speaking at leading tech summits and uh, meetups such as the NASCOM product on Clive, for example. Jay has addressed blockchain topics across various countries, such as Switzerland, the UK, France, India, and Singapore, apart from regularly communicating with various business leaders, both within and outside the Society General Group. The key takeaways that you can expect from this evening's webinar with Jay are the following. To understand and appreciate why blockchain matters, to comprehend how it fits into the financial policy of various countries and banks, to know about the type of jobs that the rise of blockchain will create, and also to understand the skills required for you to work with blockchain systems. Uh, a couple of announcements. You can um, join our LinkedIn group, IPL School of Data Science, to stay in touch and get regular updates on the latest trends in data science and also access short, impactful videos by various data scientists and uh, subscribe to our event updates, etc. Um, for uh, questions that you would like to pose to um, Jay, uh, over the course of this webinar. Uh, you can type them out in the question and answers window. You can also tweet to us at School of DS. I repeat, at School of DS. And you can chat with us on our Facebook page, the IPL School of Data Science. The best question for um, that is posed this evening wins um, this book, Blockchain uh, Revolution by Don Tapscott and Alex Tapscott, a book that has been highly recommended by Jay himself. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Jay for what I'm sure is going to be a completely enthralling webinar this evening. Good evening uh, to all the, all the attendees for the webinar. As um, I, I was invited by IPL to present a session on blockchain, which is one of the emerging technologies that has ended up capturing the imagination of many. So through the session, uh, I would want to educate you on what this trend is all about. What are the sort of various jobs that exist in the scope of uh, the blockchain as an industry? And where are we seeing more and more use cases that are being applied uh, using blockchain? So those are the segments I would want to cover as a part of today's session. So one of the first things we would want to, uh, before we go into understanding blockchain, 
as a distributed ledger, as we call it, it's better to understand the origin of this entire technology. Why was there a need for such a technology to come into existence in the first place? Now, many of you may have heard of different type of cryptocurrencies. If you see traditionally, currencies in any country are a reflection of the country's for the policies right the strength of a currency is often seen as a strength of um, is a reflection on their economy and it's also seen as a reflection of uh, the buying power of the currency so there's a whole lot of things that goes into what makes a currency and many many countries as you know are on the fiat sort of currencies but one thing that is common amongst all these are these are centralized these are run as instruments of policy by a government that has been elected so typically the, this is how currencies have always been now in 2009 right at the time when a lot of banks were getting bailed out there was a, a quirky little white paper that came out and this white paper spoke about how a world where a currency could be completely decentralized this was not uh, obviously taken seriously by many but in any other time if such a paper had come out in the world people would have ignored it but at that point the sentiment of you know governments bailing out banks for some of the bad loans that were taken was so high that people started to take a look at what this currency was all about now this currency which today we know quite popularly as the bitcoin and the white paper, what I'm referring to, was the one written by Satoshi Nakamoto way back in 2009. Now, what made this so special? You know, Bitcoin was the world's first decentralized, digital, virtual cryptocurrency. Right? Now, all these key words are quite important. And uh, this distinguishes uh, this currency from any other type of uh, currency, what you may have come across. The first thing is it's decentralized in the sense technically there is no central authority that is controlling uh, creation of this asset or distribution of this asset it is not centralized which is the case for example if you take india rbi is responsible for cre creation of this currency and banks who act as agents work as intermediaries to distribute them but not so in the case of um, this of, of bitcoin Bitcoin is decentralized in the sense technically any of these miners can end up creating. I'll tell you what the miner is, the background image. I'll give you the context before we go there. The second uh, important aspect of this was it was virtual currency. In the, virtual currencies are not new. I mean, you, you may have been comfortable using uh, Paytm or PayPal. So what this means is you have uh, fiat money in some account. You're able to transfer this to another account and you're able to use it seamlessly so virtual is not special but bitcoin has this feature next most important part is it's a digital currency now this is where it gets uh, tricky digital currencies have been existing in the world of gaming from a long time where you could use assets that you procure within a environment or an ecosystem and use it for purchasing something within the same ecosystem has existed but taking this currency and using it for a whole lot of real world payments that's where this digital currency bit became quite important and finally as i said it's a cryptocurrency there's a lot of cryptographic elements that go into protecting what has made the elements of this currency so if you see the fundamental tenets of what a bitcoin was bringing in it was different from most of the fiat currencies that have and most of the fiat currencies that exist in, in the systems today to elaborate the point a little more if you had uh, for example, uh, let's say an asset like a, like a watch and you had only one version of this watch that was ever available on this planet. It is pretty straightforward. If you hand over this watch to another individual, it is very clear there was only one copy of this watch that existed. And once you hand it over to someone else, obviously there can't be a duplicate of this watch. I'm not talking about counterfeit or anything. If there was only one asset, it is very clear if an asset is physical. But 
let's assume a world where the watch is not a physical asset but a completely digital asset so it's more like having an image of a watch and not really a watch itself now it opens up a huge set of problems imagine a world where i just had an image of a watch how do i guarantee that once i transfer this image of a watch to another person i cannot create copies of the same watch and give it to x y and z if you take this concept of what i explained from a watch to the value of uh, to to money you can see how the problem becomes a lot more complex if i only had let's say a 2000 rupee note and i hand it over to a individual with that unique reference number i know there should have technically been only one note with that number right but what happens if i only have an image of the 2000 rupee note in this case there was no way for people to figure out if once i've given this copy of this 2000 rupee note that i haven't created multiple copies now if you see in an essence that is the problem bitcoin had to solve if it had to make the four tenets of a decentralized virtual digital cryptocurrency come alive and this is exactly what that white paper did it showed a way of using a platform through which you could ensure all these four uh, parameters that i just mentioned the platform that helped to protect bitcoin from ensuring that it uh, it could not be counterfeited or ensuring that once it is used so much, someone else won't be able to reuse it that platform is what is today known as blockchain so i'll go back a little more detail on what makes a blockchain but here is a quick you know capture of what really happens when a bitcoin transaction takes place between two entities now for bitcoin transactions unlike a real world uh, transaction a real world real fiat, fiat currency transactions what you require is a bitcoin wallet now these wallets are uh, can be downloaded um, off um, from any of the standard app uh, stores what you have once you have this wallet that is configured what ends up happening is all these wallets are connected to something called nodes i'll explain all this in detail as we go ahead this is just to explain how a bitcoin transaction works these nodes are geographically distributed they're all all over the planet and the only way you are recognized on the system is through a public and private key combination now the private key is not supposed to be revealed of course it's um, but the public key is how you are recognized on the network so if anyone wanted to send you a bitcoin or any cryptocurrency in of this nature the only way for them to do is if they know what your public key is the moment they know what your public key is you don't have to go through any centralized authority to go through any checks it's not like adding you know a beneficiary in your bank account and going through neft kind of centralized systems here the moment i have a public key of an individual i can just tag it to them and instantly make a payment to them if i wanted so the moment i do this what happens is my public key and using a combination of my private key a digital hash is created and this is distributed to all the nodes that exist in the network now although there are multiple nodes that are connected in the system there are some specialized nodes that exist and these are called miners the job of the miners is to verify whatever has happened till now follows the rules of the system in the sense you it is not a duplicate transaction there is a hash that is getting generated i'll explain again all the hash and all that a little bit later and it ensures that once a transaction is used it can never be reused for any other transaction it ensures all of this and only after this is done it it goes through a sort of a lottery system to figure out um, it's not really technically a lottery it's more of a it's called a proof of work there's a consensus protocol that is triggered and at the end of it the miner who managed to get this list of blocks certified is granted a set of cryptocurrencies which today is about 12.5 uh, bitcoins if we are talking about bitcoins for a miner who manages to successfully discover a block and this is how bitcoins can ever be generated but once you have a bitcoin as an a miner gets a bitcoin you can buy bitcoin off the market today 
you have some uh, websites in india as well where you could go provide your inr and in return be credited with a bitcoin which you can use for a series of transactions so this is what you need to get as a context of what is a bitcoin how does a bitcoin transaction happen and how does a blockchain go about enabling this and this is the context for this image so how does the blockchain part really work so we saw the elements of uh, bitcoin and what it does but to really make this sort of uh, cryptocurrency work there are some underlying elements what a blockchain requires the first and foremost element that it requires is extensive use of something called cryptography now this may have been a term that a few of you all may have heard in the past but for those of you all who haven't heard cryptography is using um, so this is uh, this is something that has been directly from the world of military if there are two ways in which information can be sent from one party to another and again think of it from a military analogy right if i wanted to send information about how my armed forces are going to attack or i i need to send information about what my uh, the enemy is doing on the other side of the spectrum there was one way where you take the entire information you know as it is and you hide the information and send it across to the other side of uh, to to wherever your interest to send now the problem with sending information like this is if at all people figure out how you have hidden this information once the information is unhidden in a way the whole information uh, is given away to uh, to people who shouldn't have got the info and then it puts the whole operation at risk that is one way of doing it this is called steganography the other way of doing it is you take whatever is the raw information that you want to transfer to another person you apply some sort of um, algorithm on top of this you convert this information into some sort of gibberish that people cannot understand directly and send it off to the other side now even if someone intercepts your information that there is no way for them to figure out what this information really stood for now one of the biggest employments of this sort of a technique was done by julius caesar he used something called uh, caesar uh, shift in his uh, and um, the, the way that worked is the alphabet starts from a to z what he used to do was using a special keyword which could be like caesar or hail or some four di four digit or five uh, five um, alphabet keyword when you put that and you offset the alphabets for example a will now become a h and b will become a i and so on and now you take whatever is your main text and you apply this sort of a alphabet not the original alphabet suddenly you change the very nature of what uh, is the text there what you sent now if even someone accidentally comes across the text that you have if they are not able to identify what was the initial algorithm that was used to convert this there is no way they'll be able to figure out what was the information that was being exchanged now this is what caesar shift is and i'm talking about this uh, quite some time ago from there to if you see now with the advanced uh, features we've got in computing cryptography has come a long way and one of the key elements that we use in a blockchain based system are something called sha this stands for secure hash algorithms this is used extensively for protecting any communication that happens on the blockchain based systems any digital signature that is applied on the system all of them use the sha system now i'll just give you an example of how the sha works here you see you see this is a sentence um, and for this entire sentence that you see on your left hand side when you run it through a sha 256 hash you get a weird alpha you know you get an alpha numeric as you see on the right side now any small change in the input data can result in huge changes in the output data but irrelevant to where you are on the planet as as long as you are applying the same hashing function on the same text the result will always be the same so as you can see the second example brown the word was introduced it was changed from one place to another as you can see the or, the text has changed massively from how the first hash was 
you see the third sentence we just added a full stop and you see the hash has no relevance to what the original um, statement was and as you can see irrelevant to the size of the text for example you could have one terabyte of data on the left hand side the output will always be a unique 256 you know character value which uniquely represents whatever you're putting on the left hand side now this is an amazing property of um, in, in cryptography as you can see this sort of information can be used to figure out digital signatures that are signed and sent to someone uh, it, these are technical concepts called commitments all these rely on a huge amount of math that happens behind the scenes and sha is unidirectional you you cannot use the right hand side of the function and ever understand what the original text was but with the original text if you apply the hashing function you will always get only this value so you can clearly see this can be a huge asset to how you can exploit in the crypto world so this is used extensively in the blockchain based um, system the second most important part of what you have is something called a digital signature now many of you may have used uh, rsa tokens if you if you are in any banking system or if you're connecting using citrix servers to your uh, from from home to your corporate ne networks uh, you would have seen uh, rsa token now these tokens are something where you would have seen the numbers change quite frequently now if you see what is happening behind the scenes what it's exploiting a very interesting uh, feature in mathematics which is about prime numbers you see prime numbers are not uniformly distributed um, you know when you look at uh, from number theory when you study it in detail it's very difficult to predict which is the next prime number now what rsa uses is a very intelligent way where if you take two prime numbers and multiply computers can do this very quickly you know you give a multiplication problem a computer can do it very very quickly but when you give the result of this problem and then you ask the computer to predict which were the two prime numbers that resulted in creation of this final number now the computer is in a little bit of a fix it now has to identify the set of prime numbers and then multiply the two prime numbers and then eventually tell you that these were the two prime numbers that gave you the number i'm obviously grossly undersimplifying i mean oversimplifying sorry the, the problem of rsa but what you need to understand is it uses this property in uh, in mathematics where prime number multiplication is easy but once you give the result asking it which were the two prime numbers that made it is slightly difficult now that is what rsa uh, has done and it has managed really well for all this all these years but with today's day and age what we're seeing is with the sort of computing power that exists rsa on very lightweight systems like your mobile phones and so on can be breached so what a blockchain based systems use is something called ecdsa which is called elliptic curve digital signature algorithm why is this important elliptic curves do not use such prime number factoring where there is at least one way if you had a super uh, really efficient computer some good algorithms there was a chance for you to figure out what were the two prime numbers that made it but in elliptic curves it uses a, a very um, a part of mathematics that not many people are uh, equipped with which is on elliptic curves and it uses properties there which are difficult to breach uh, just to give you an example uh, there was a, a, a paper written by a security researcher called Arjun Lenstra and his paper mentioned that if you compare key strength to key strength between RSA and ECDSA if you took just a 22-bit RSA and applied something called a brute force attack to find out if just for 22 bits if you had to use brute force to hack it of course the computers will get uh, hot you know technically and using that heat what could you do so they found out for breaking through rsa what will happen is uh, it would produce as much heat as uh, heating a teaspoon of water Th that's what will happen if you use brute force on um, rsa for the same key strength if you try to use brute force on ecdsa the amount of energy that it could potentially create can boil all water on planet earth so i'm talking about just a 22 bit key and what rsa uh, what ecdsa is used in bitcoins are 256 bytes 
okay so it's like a big difference uh, between the between the two so this is the difference all digital signatures on the blockchain based uh, platform use ecdsa and not um, rsa based systems the third most important part is consensus what do i mean by this the data in blockchain based systems are decentralized in the sense they are distributed across the globe now the moment you distribute the data across there should be some way for you to figure out how to bring uh, a consensus between agreeing parties so bitcoin based systems use something called proof of work but there are many other sort of systems that exist today you have proof of authority proof of stake there are different consensus protocols that exist in today's world and last but not the least smart contracts now smart contracts are not a new concept you know all the, this concept has been in um, as a concept it has been existing from the 90s um, but what what it means is once you put a code on a blockchain based system because you cannot create or you i mean it is tamper resistant you can put a code that cannot be changed which means you can take a contract the terms of the contract can be put into a code and this can be put on the blockchain ensuring no one will be able to modify it once this code goes into the into the system and you can use the code for a lot of things you know you could uh, for example uh, based on some stock positions you can buy or sell there's a whole lot of things you can do with the smart contract world now the key thing to remember is cryptography digital signatures consensus smart contracts none of them are just inventions of uh, blockchain or uh, bitcoin based systems these all have existed in the past yeah, it's not uh, anything new but what satoshi did in a genius move is he took these technologies from which were built for totally different use cases and bought them under one umbrella and that's what makes uh, the entire blockchain based system so fascinating and this is where a lot of use cases uh, are being explored in today's world so that's the essence of what we're trying to do but does this mean with this basic understanding of um, what i've given you about blockchain does this mean i mean how do you go about um, making a career in in this sort of I think we're having a slight audio issue with um, Jay's audio. So if you can just give us a minute, we're just trying to get him back.
Hi everyone, please hang in there. Jay will be back with us soon. We have some very interesting questions and answers uh, coming up. Please stay in. Hi, um, did I did you lose me uh, in between? Yeah, we did Hello? for a little while. Hi, Jay, can you hear us? Um, till what? Uh, till what point uh, was I on the on the line, and when did you we could me? hear you until you started this slide? Okay, I, I I'm I'm here. Uh, did you hear about the different frameworks that I spoke about, or do I cover that? Okay. You, I think you could cover that because it was breaking off in between. Okay, is it better now? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. So let me come back um, on this slide. So. On the challenges um, ahead, uh, I was just starting to explain if you wanted to make a career as a blockchain developer, one of the first things I would recommend is there is a lot of uh, content available already online. There are Coursera courses where, which you could definitely use to understand a little more about the basics of what makes blockchain tick. But the best way to learn this is to download the open source code on your own computers and start learning them building your own virtual machines. There is no other replacement to this if you want to become a seasoned developer. Now, even if you want to go on that route, you will see multiple options to which way you want to go. The easiest one to learn is something called the Hyperledger Fabric. And the reason why Fabric is more easier is because IBM has a big push on fabric related content. And they've created something called Composer, which makes it very easy for you to kind of create this complex workflow logic on on a blockchain based uh, system. So you have one option, which is Hyperledger Fabric. The second option you have is Hyperledger Sawtooth. Now this is again an open source, but majorly uh, pushed by Intel. So that is one option where you could try. There is also Iroha, which is not very popular uh, by developers, but there is an open source framework in that space too. Now Quorum is, a, is JP Morgan's product, which has been open sourced. And uh, this provides very high privacy. It has very similar I mean, features like Hyperledger Fabric. This is also something that I would recommend you could download if you're looking at building use cases which require high privacy. Then you have Ethereum itself, which you can run on your test network. You have Multi-Chain, which is a fork of Bitcoin, which can again be run on your own systems. So all these frameworks are free to use. All you need is time and energy to go through and start learning and building on them. And the use cases can easily build on top of this. Uh, it's not a big challenge to, uh, once you start getting the hang of it, it is not technically very difficult. But one thing is most of these, uh, the programming languages that are used are not something that is normally uh, known by developers. For example, uh, Corda, R3 Corda uses something called uh, Kotlin which has very similar properties to uh, which has very similar properties to java but then the reason why such such languages are chosen is because the ability to hack it is also limited if people really do not know how uh, if they do not know the language itself in a lot of details so th those are some of the key tips i would say if you are keen about um, understanding blockchain and learning the best solution is uh, and one other recommendation is there's a platform called edx and edX is a platform for learning more about Hyperledger Fabric. I would definitely recommend any of you who is keen to learn more about this tech to look at edX content too, apart from um, the other forums where you can learn about them. So those are some of the challenges if you are trying to get into a blockchain-based space. You need to know the basics really well. Otherwise, even though you can build use cases on top of it, you will never be able to appreciate where blockchain should be applied and that is the mistake i've seen many developers make they just try to get in directly start writing their own smart contracts without realizing what is the underlying tech that is protecting uh, the whole framework so that's one uh, one tip that i have and the second thing you should remember is a blockchain based system is introduction of a total parallel network it is not just a solution like a machine learning solution where you can just load it up in a model and plug it into your IT. That's not how it works. It, it uses internet to communicate between nodes. So if you end up uh, putting this in use cases where um, this sort of um, network 
uh, that you're going to introduce doesn't add value it's a whole wasted opportunity if you end up doing it so these are some of the things that uh, keen developers and who are uh, listeners of this if you are interested um, th these are some things that you need to take note of the next uh, important point is the frameworks i just explained about them there are various frameworks that depend on what you want to do if you want a private blockchain which is what most banks are now not just banks most entities are ending up creating consortiums of their own so they are running more and more private blockchains if you run it like that ethereum is a good choice if you are running it on the test network quorum is also a good choice if you have high privacy hyperledger fabric can be run on both the modes and uh, it depends on what you want r3 corda primarily is driven as a private blockchain what you run within the consortium so the, depending on the use case you can choose the framework that you require we can go on for a long time only on that but on the interest of time i'm going to move to the next one so one big problem with uh, blockchain is today uh, the standards for blockchain do not exist because it is still being uh, it's a nascent technology it's an emerging one so it is not yet there I, i'm already a part of uh, the bureau of indian standards and i'm a part of the specific wing that is focusing on blockchain standards and i'm also a part of the international standards and we clearly see this would take some more time 2019 and 2020 is when you will see the standards becoming mainstream but that does not mean you do not have to start working on it you can continue to start working on um, on these projects but standards are evolving this is an aspect that you need to remember when you're walking in this space the second common grouse you may hear about blockchain based system is that they don't play with volumes really well it is true for the bitcoin network and maybe the ethereum network initially that it was not able to scale a lot but once there it's only a change in configuration that bitcoin or all these networks require and once you change that scale the volumes that blockchain can handle is a lot more than what mastercard and visa can process you know it's it's a lot more higher than that but to do that there are side effects that need to be done but in private blockchains this is not a problem this is more on the public blockchain that we see you know, the volumes of transactions is an issue now the second uh, another big problem when you start using blockchain is you also need to upgrade your internal it systems to be able to absorb what a blockchain based system is trying to do what a blockchain system does it removes anything that becomes an intermediary so if your it systems are not upgraded for example if you build them as monolith applications and they're not more service oriented and blockchain engages a lot with the api based connections to your system it expects you to take a look at your entire it strategy and figure out whether the cost of using a blockchain based solution is worth it or uh, whether there should be some other way you want to do it and blockchain is not necessarily a solution in all the cases but in a case where the use case is really good it's it's worth trying a blockchain based one and of course uh, if you have a huge amount of legacy putting in a blockchain that could also end up becoming a frustration because the upgrade of all this uh, all the other systems need to be done before you start plugging in blockchain one so these are some of the things you need to remember while you are exploring blockchain a little more in depth these parameters can go a long way in you choosing the right use case i'm going to expedite it a little bit i think we are running a little bit close of time so just in a nutshell the sort of challenges that exist in the blockchain world today one is it's a nascent technology but it's evolving very rapidly there are standards there are multiple protocols and at least at this moment there are three major protocols and we need to see if there's going to be some consolidation that will happen in the coming years in the existing infrastructure there are some weak links that that do exist for example if the if your system is not ready we just cannot go plug in a blockchain and the volume of transactions people generally use this as a reason for not exploring blockchain that is not necessarily true but yes if you take one of the standard way you know software that is existing yes volume is a problem if your use case has high volume of data and invariably you have to work with existing legacy applications and that is one big challenge if you are introducing blockchain now how do we take it forward as i mentioned the best way to learn something is to experiment it if you are from any of the companies or a startup you should start experimenting more on the use cases within a closed environment and once you are comfortable with it then uh, use it for beta testing with live customers or uh, with a live use case and then roll it out in small segments 
that is the way you should use a used uh, blockchain not with a big bang approach there are a lot of startups working in uh, in the area of blockchain and uh, they exist uh, from helping in decentralized iot to market prediction to ownership of digital content to ride sharing there's a whole lot of use cases again this slide itself we can talk for a good one day i i think we will have to progress on some of the other topics we need to touch upon so what are some of the global implementations that have happened using blockchain well land records in estonia and sweden they are getting digitized using blockchain so that people do not tamper with the data that exists in trade finance a society general uh, i led this experiment called easy trading connect you can just search about this on the internet or on youtube you would find a lot of content about this we tried to see how letter of credit process can be digitized so we did this experiment with ing abn namro musk is doing an experiment on their own with ibm and ic ic ici worked with infosys to come up with a solution so there are stock exchanges which are implementing blockchain information tech like storej is a company that is competing with cloud companies that is one so centralized currencies are now becoming more digital currencies which are government backed that's happening uh, identity management is more like a kyc of yourself and there's a company called showcard that's working and everledger is a company that is helping to show provenance of diamonds so a whole lot of use cases are exploring uh, blockchain based use uh, blockchain as one of the solutions what they require so in india level as well i am involved in quite a few use cases and i can advise because i i work with the central government in some of the areas to advise them one that is being considered is uh, secure storage of digital records so there is a good use case for uh, for blockchain there cyber security basically for protecting critical infrastructure blockchain can be a good source there uh, all the municipal records so that it cannot be tampered and easily uh, verifiable that's a good use case so the the market actors uh, so again here instead of centralized power if you can distribute it it can come back and finally transparency so these are all some of the india use cases and i can tell you some of these use cases are already underway and uh, by 2019 you will see more of them coming up and uh, in this space so there are some augmenting technologies as well that work in conjunction well internet of things which generates the data for securing that blockchain could be of good use machine learning and deep learning on top of this uh, quantum computing is something that's coming up in the future it's worth checking keeping an eye on that and ipfs is something that is also thought about how the inter the world wide web itself will look like so these are some of the things that are coming as augmenting technologies for blockchain so that's uh, precisely where we stand about uh, blockchain and i've tried to keep this information to at least give you a primer on what this is and how you can go about using this the sort of careers that you can make out of this now i'll take a moment to see if there were any questions that you all have come up with and i can use this opportunity to, to answer those questions we have uh, several questions that have come in for you jay but uh, in the interest of time we'll uh, stick to just three so the first question for today is is blockchain only for developers wanting to make a career out of it what about technical managers definitely blockchain is not only for uh, developers technical managers um, in fact the role i play in my organization is more of a technical manager although i do have good development experience but my role predominantly is about technical managers so the same skill sets what you require here are to is the ability to understand the proper use case and ensure that the team who you are managing are able to uh, implement a use case in the best possible manner so in fact i would recommend technical managers should definitely have a good understanding of blockchain as as an emerging technology because more and more use cases in the future will have a layer of blockchain below all the other data layer of storage because it's the version of truth that a blockchain maintains so definitely technical managers can have a real good career by understanding blockchain in detail okay the second question for today how can cryptocurrency be the pathway to a cashless economy and be helpful in lowering uh, in commodity pricing so cryptocurrency 
is not necessarily a solution uh, i i would call it is not necessarily the only solution to a cashless economy there are already drives that are happening as you may have seen to go more and more cashless uh, just to give you a point this is not just a drive in india in india we are going more and more towards wallets you may have seen a host of uh, uh, wallets that have come into the marketplace and today you you are able to transact a lot without really having to use cash now you go to the next uh, level you look at what china is trying to do and the the amount of cashless uh, i mean the amount of cashless uh, things that are there in uh, china is mind boggling wechat which is their de facto platform is used as a in instead of cash in almost any outlet you in in some cases cash is optional but wechat is mandatory you know that is the sort it's going but cryptocurrency at least uh, in the way i look at it now even governments are trying to push for uh, crypto based uh, digital currencies that are coming in but it is not really the solution of it is not designed to lower the commodity pricing or neither to become the only way to reach cashless so it is not a direct um, link between the two okay our uh, third and final question for this evening a uh, currency is the legal tender of the state does the individual only provide the legal tender in the case of bitcoin also what are the legal wrangles that can come in the way of bitcoin okay so the currency is the legal tender of the state uh, and this is uh, this is because it is enacted um, as a law that rbi is the only authority in i'm talking about the example of india Uh, reserve bank of Ind india has been created as an act uh, by the parliament and they are the only ones who are allowed to kind of uh, print the notes so yes it is also a legal tender because the government says so if you see how this currency is backed it is backed it's a fiat currency you trust the currency as much as you have trust in the government and this is exactly why most countries have them as the legal tender now when you buy a bitcoin you need to understand bitcoin is not in any way traditionally or uh, as currency is used at all it's almost akin to using gold you know gold is not technically a currency but you use it as an asset through which you can purchase services or uh, any other uh, any other things you want bitcoin in many ways has very similar properties to gold one is there is only a finite amount of bitcoins that are existing in the system that is one that is true for example at the end of 21st millionth bitcoin no longer will the the bitcoin blockchain ever produce any more of it so there is a finite supply of uh, this is that exactly like gold there is no infinite supply second one it its value is roughly constant for example the value of gold doesn't the market may decide the price to go up and down but the way gold is extracted does not have a direct impact on its price so which is similar to how mining uh, bitcoin and then the pricing of bitcoins are totally different uh, uh, you know, totally different things so what we need to explain here is when you're using a bitcoin all you're trying to do is use this mechanism with someone else who accepts this as currency that's about it i wouldn't go into the term whether it's legal tender or not it's technically not a legal tender it is just an alternative for you to exchange goods and services and that's what bitcoin does the third part of your question is what are the legal wrangles that can come in the bitcoin exactly what i explained in the second point since it is a way for you to exchange goods and services and this is not centrally controlled by a government it can obviously run in parallel with how uh, the government wants to execute its um, its rights the whole reason a currency is created is so that all the services and that people avail from a country and how the country collects its taxes there could be one common means of uh, exchange between the citizens and the country but if you go into the bitcoin by very nature it is decentralized and it's distributed all over then it becomes a little bit of a problem so i would say as a policy uh, within india cryptocurrencies do not seem to have the flavor it is seen as uh, i would say it, there is no active encouragement and generally it is discouraged i would say although i would uh, 
claim it to be illegal there are a lot of rumors that are floating uh, in the markets more than illegal it is frowned upon but it could easily be categorized as illegal uh, because uh, there are also rumors that a lot of uh, cryptos are getting used in illicit trade again this is a lot more speculative than what it is yes there are cases where people use this but that is not the only reason there are many people who are holding cryptocurrencies as a legitimate alternative ways of investment so i wouldn't read too much into it the legal wrangles are if more and more people start using bitcoins then it could slowly start eroding uh, faith in the currency that is the de facto currency so yes there could be legal wrangles if these sort of challenges do come into play so those are the three questions um, yeah, what i see here yeah. were there any other questions uh, um no Jay, primarily these we did have a couple of others um but i think we're kind of running out of time so if we could just wrap up okay or would you so like I, to take I, a couple I hope, more questions uh, i can if there are a couple more questions i can take i think it, sure it okay. would be informative so, for them yes, we lost the audio in between minutes. a bit so Jack, can I you think, see the questions? I can I can see only the three questions. Uh, I can't see the other questions. Are there are there anything else? Yeah. Uh, can uh, bitcoins be considered as regular tangible asset classes? For example, gold. What factors determine bitcoin market value, price, and variance? Okay. I think I answered this question even before it was asked. I, I didn't see this question prior to this. Uh, what I, uh, what, as I answered previously, for example, when someone's mining gold, right, um, to the price of gold, there is no direct correlation. As you can see, the mining continues on a day in day out basis, but the price of gold is fixed by the market on a day in day out basis. So that's what generally happens. So there is no direct correlation between, uh, between the two the price of a bitcoin is purely based on the factors of supply and demand than anything else like any other commodity in the market so there's nothing uh, unique about this okay um so jay we'll do um, one last question and then finish okay um how do the traditional oltp concepts like a transaction adhering to acid properties fit into the blockchain context mm -hmm. Okay, so as a standard relational databases are a very different or, um, or transaction processing databases were designed for very different purposes. These were designed to ensure huge volumes of data were stored and stacked and to be analyzed so to derive some insights. Or if you look at RDBMS in general, it was designed as a relational databases where you had tables which were linked to each other and uh, kind of went one layer above how files were managed now if you look at blockchain it is not running against any of these principles but technically the purpose why this is built is not to just remain a database the strong features of a blockchain based system are more in line with crypto and uh, basically the cryptography and more of distributed consensus mechanism than to serve as a database so if your use case requires more of analytics uh, or more of just how how relational sort of data to form some insights you do not need to get into blockchain at all these can be done through traditional rdbms the use cases for blockchain are slightly different and more where you're trying to bring in multiple actors together who do not completely trust each other and they can use a blockchain based system so the it's not about confusing asset properties with this the the way or the, the reason why these tools exist are for very different purposes. I think with that, I think we've just at the nick of time, uh, we've, come, we've come to the last question. So Devika, back to you. Thank you so much, Jay. So um, the winner for this evening uh, is Abhijit for his question on how crypto might as assist in a cashless economy. And I think we'll wrap up now. Jay, on behalf of everyone at the Institute of Product Leadership and the School of Data Science, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule and doing this webinar with us. It's indeed, it's been, I mean, fascinating and a complete learning experience for all of us. So thank you so much, Jay. 
thank you thanks for all the thanks to all the attendees and to institute of product leadership for inviting me thank you so much good night everyone good night good night